Gun licensing in South Africa is under scrutiny again after the introduction of the recent Firearms Control Amendment Bill. This week on Farmers Inside Track, gun expert Mark Mulder outlines the current firearm application process for farmers in Mzanzi. We share highlights from Food for Mzanzi's Pan-African Summit on Youth in Sustainable Agriculture, where Minister Toko Didiza called on young people of Africa to engage and grow a vibrant agricultural sector for the sake of sustainable food security on our continent. We're also joined by Western Cape Minister of Agriculture, Dr. Ivan Mayer, who recognized the more than 200,000 agri-workers contributing to food production in the province, saluting third-generation agri-worker Audrey September, who was announced as the 2021 Western Cape Prestige Agri Awards winner. Sibangos Sipa joins our Agripreneur 101 segment. Now, her chocolate chip cookies had clients at Amazing Spaces running back for more, and now she proudly markets her own cookie range called Mama Bongi. And on top of our book pile is The Lie of 1952 by Patrick Tarek Mellet. And our farmer tip of the week comes from beekeeper and founder of Eden Roots, Metzana Kojane. This is Farmer's Inside Track, supported by Food for Mzansi. Inspiration for your business and life. From South Africa's farmers and agripreneurs. Hey, I'm Zanzi, and welcome to episode 102 of Food for Zanzi's podcast called Farmers Inside Track. I am Dawn Numdu, the editor for audience and engagement at Food for Zanzi, and joining me is my co host, Duncan Masiwa. Absolutely wonderful to be back, Dawn, but let's kick off the show with that promised talk about gun licensing in South Africa. Now, Nicole Ludov chats to gun expert Mark Mulder to outline the recent Firearms Control Amendment Bill and the current firearm application process in Mzanzi. Nicole, over to you. Thank you so much, Dawn and Duncan. Mark, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, please? How did you get into the firearms industry? I'm from a company called gunlicense.co.za. We're based in Somerset West in the Western Cape. We are a company that specializes in the entire firearms licensing process from A to Z and everything in between. We provide proficiency training, we provide competency assistance, firearm licensing of all different kinds, new licenses, license renewals, estate firearms, security companies, and also a little bit of tactical training. I started out in the industry, I've, I've been working in the industry from the age of 18, so it's about a decade now. I started out in competitive clay pigeon shooting, got a couple of titles under my belt. And I was then offered a job at a big firearm retailer, worked there for probably about five years. The company went through a bit of a corporate takeover and it was time to do my own thing. So then I started Gun License today in 2017. Just kind of evolved from there and some exciting things happening at the moment in partnership with our partner company, Gunnery Arms and Ammo. We are opening up an indoor shooting range next to our premises, which is going to be quite cool. And, you know, helping people license uh, firearms and put people in a situation where they can protect themselves and participate in their various sport shooting disciplines and can continue to use their firearms for hunting, putting meat on the table. Can you please provide us with a brief overview of the gun license application process? The firearm licensing process is a three-step process from having absolutely no experience with firearms to being a licensed firearm owner. The first step is going to be proficiency, the second step is competency, and the third step is the physical firearm licensing itself. So the first step, proficiency, involves purchasing modules from a training academy, taking the modules home, and completing your open book test. Once you've completed your open book test, you'll need to complete a closed book test at the training academy, as well as a practical evaluation. So guys have started doing it a little bit differently now, which is really cool to see where us, for example, we run very, very small classes. We personally do not have more than four students in one of our classes. So each and every student gets personal attention that they deserve and that they need to really get up to a level where they're confident to start the firearm licensing process. We make sure that people can ask questions. We make sure that it's a safe, relaxed learning environment. The old stigma of, you know, rock up there and there's going to be this aggressive guy in camo that's going to push you through the class doesn't happen like that anymore. So it's really, really cool. It's a supportive environment and it's a fun process as well. 
So once the students have completed their closed book test, we give them training on the physical handle and use of the firearm themselves. We take them to the shooting range and we make sure that they get the training that they need. They then pass the practical evaluation. They are then issued with proficiency certificates, which basically mean that they've passed the test. They are on the level that they need to be to start the firearm licensing process. Step number two is competency. This process involves using your proficiency certificates to complete an application, which will then be handed into your nearest designated firearms officer. Your application for competency will then go through a process where they do a criminal record check. They make sure that your certificates are in order. They check your character references. So basically, they make sure that you are a fit and proper person in terms of the law to actually own a firearm. So they definitely do the checks and balances. Once your competency has been approved, then this is the point where you basically need to decide what firearms you'd actually like to license. So how it works is each firearm has its separate license. So let's say, for example, you would like to license three firearms. You are then going to end up with three separate firearm licenses. So how this works is you need to, first of all, secure a firearm for yourself. If you're going to buy it from a shop, you need to pay for the firearm and purchase the serial number. If you're going to have it gifted from a friend, that's a different process where the friend will basically just need to sign on the police forms as the current owner. We also deal with security company applications. We deal with deceased estates where firearm has been passed down, an inheritance piece. But uh, it all follows basically the same process where an application pack is compiled. We obviously offer this assistance to guys that need that, where we offer money back guarantee also on our work. And what this includes is uh, filling in police paperwork, a SAPS 271. We make sure that all of the attachments and everything are correctly compiled. We do all the print work. We also do a motivation, usually of about between 40 to 70 pages, detailing each and every reason why that client needs that exact firearm. So it's a bit of a process. It's definitely made a lot easier through you know use of a professional company, but it is something that people can do by themselves. So this is not a the only way to do it. You can do all of these paperwork applications by yourself, but it definitely does make it easier to go through a company. Once your application pack is ready, go back to your designated farms officer, you hand it in. From there, it goes through the police system again. And once all the checks are done, you will then be issued with your firearm license card for each firearm that you have licensed. And you can at that point take possession of your firearm. In your experience, What are the most common mistakes people make when they apply for a gun license? I would say is not applying for the firearm license. A lot of people put it off or they're discouraged from actually applying because of all of the rumors and all the nonsense flying around at the moment. You know, that you can't get a gun license anymore. You know, if you do shoot someone in self-defense, you'll go to jail. You know, all of these different things that are going around, which is absolute nonsense. The one thing that we hear from all of the clients or most of the clients that we help the first-time gun owners, their biggest regret is that they didn't start sooner. This process does take a little while. The police have a mandated 120 working days at this point. is a little bit longer than what they usually have. 90 days is the usual. It's a little bit of a waiting game, but it's 100% worth the wait. When your farm license actually comes through, everybody will wish that it started sooner. So I'd say that's probably the biggest mistake that people make is, is putting it off and delaying you know, waiting for you know, an incident to happen or waiting for a hunting trip invitation to then be, oh my goodness, we need a gun. Owning a firearm, especially for the purpose of self-defense, it's almost like wearing a safety belt. You can't crash your car, go flying through the windshield and then reach for your safety belt. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Besides not getting started sooner, I would say people try and tackle the application process by themselves. A lot of people don't know what to write in the motivations. They aren't quite sure of the paperwork, so they just try. And they get refused because of arbitrary reasons, such as lack of motivation, or maybe the police paperwork wasn't filled in correctly. Another big mistake that people make is they go to someone that does it cheaper, (laughs) if that makes sense. So you get guys that claim to be able to help with the paperwork and the licensing process. They charge far under what the going rate is. They basically end up delivering substandard work, which then gets submitted to the police. And unfortunately, a lot of the time, those guys get declined. So they say the best time to apply for a gun license is eight months ago. The second best time is today. Lastly, how do you feel about the proposed amendments to the Firearms Control Act? This is sentiment shared with most South Africans at the moment, is that it is a very cheeky attack on our human rights, on our civil liberties. It's the fourth time that the government has tried this in the last 10 years. It does not go through 
anytime it gets shot down in the courts, it's not going to happen. I think that it would be a massive blunder if that were ever to go through. Luckily, we do have a constitution which is intact. We've got faith in the constitution. We don't see it happening. Thanks, Nicole. And thanks for your advice, Mark Mulder, who's, of course, a gun expert. Now, for more information on this, visit www.foodformzanzi.co.za. Next up, we share highlights from Food for Mzanzi's Pan-African Summit on Youth in Sustainable Agriculture, where Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development Minister Toko Dudiza called on young people of Africa to engage and then grow a vibrant agricultural sector for the sake of sustainable food security on our continent. This summit coincides with the birthday of Food for Mzanzi online publication. Happy birthday to you and may you grow in leaps and bounds. Food from Zanzi in its three years have done so much in profiling the agricultural sector in our country. It has ensured that the diverse and critical views are heard. At the height of COVID-19 pandemic, this online publication has fed the sector with information and advice relating to regulations that impacted on agriculture and agribusiness industry. As we're preparing for the UN summit, on food systems. They were there to carry the views of stakeholders, including perspectives from young people, women, and people living with disabilities. Delegates, this summit represents an important milestone in agriculture, agribusiness, and our response to climate change following the recently held COP26 held in Glasgow a week ago. Climate change is not an environmental issue alone, It is equally an agricultural and economic issue. Developing technologies that will ensure our agriculture remain resilient is now a necessity. Digitization has been propelled and fast-tracked by the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, especially when it comes to trade. We have seen in the past years how some of our countries have battled droughts and flood as a result of climate change. These phenomena have impacted smallholder and rural farmers severely. Food security has also been under threat and unemployment has been on the rise given job shedding from farm and agricultural enterprises. As if this was not enough, agricultural finance has had its own disruptions. We have an aging cohort of agricultural workers and producers, and therefore we need to attract young and agile people who will form the bedrock of agriculture and agribusiness now and in the future. We have come together as young people under the banner of agriculture where we are reigniting the spirit of Pan-Africanism. This is important as it seeks to frame our collaboration and engagement for the future. This summit offers us a platform in which we can take stock of our participation as young people in the sector, share our own experiences successes and learn from one another how we can deal with issues that are of a challenge. But at the same time, we are able to build collaborative partnerships for growth. The past year, when the COVID-19 pandemic came to our shores, it tested the resilience of our food systems. There were threats of food insecurity as countries went on total lockdown. Countries had to immediately close borders so as to manage the virus by tracking and tracing, as well as treating those who were infected as a way of slowing the virus down. This was done in order to save lives and livelihoods. Countries that were dependent on food imports were the most affected in this regard. Rapid interventions by the African Union in partnership with the Food and Agriculture Organization facilitated engagements of ministers of agriculture with the aim of finding ways of addressing this impending crisis. We were able to a large extent to succeed. But I must also say, the engagements of ministers of agriculture in the African continent, as well as the ministers of trade and finance in July last year, enabled us to locate the importance of agriculture when countries are building back 
during and even post the pandemic. We do so because agriculture remains one of the largest employer in our continent, particularly when it comes to farm enterprises as well as agribusiness. It is also a sector that ensures that we provide for food security for our nation in terms of food and fiber. But it's also a sector with which we're able to trade and give and get revenues for our countries. It is therefore important that in locating the economic recoveries of our countries, agriculture must be at the center. We have learned some lessons during this period of hard lockdowns. Firstly, we appreciated the need for strengthening rural farmers and smallholder producers in order to support household food security. Secondly, the agricultural logistics and its critical importance in the movement of goods within countries as well as for exports became even more important. Thirdly, quick amendment of agricultural certification requirements for trade from manual to electronic certification had to be put in place and negotiations with trading partners were actually necessitated in order to allow for trade albeit limited time. Remote working called for an immediate uptake of information and communication technologies so as to continue providing services to the sector even under these constraints caused by the pandemic. This impacted those in the civil service as well as the industry and farmers alike. As young people, both in and outside the agricultural sector, you need to engage and find solutions on how to grow a vibrant agricultural sector that will continue to contribute to sustainable food security for the various countries and our continent, thereby reducing poverty and hunger. I look forward to the outcomes of the summit. I believe your deliberations will go a long way in shaping our policy perspectives and improve our programmatic interventions in order to support you. Let me wish you a successful inaugural Pan-African Summit on Youth in Sustainable Agriculture. May we build the Africa we want in our lifetime. Congratulations to Food from Zanzi as you turn three years. I thank you. Great having you, Agricultural Minister Tokudu Diza. If you missed the summit or you want to review the highlights, visit www.foodformzanzi.co.za or hop on over to our YouTube channel. We now change gears from youth in sustainable agriculture to celebrating agricultural workers in Mzanzi. We're joined by Western Cape Minister of Agriculture, Dr. Ivan Mayer, who recognized the more than 200,000 agri-workers contributing to food production in the province by saluting third-generation agri-worker Audrey September, who was announced as the 2021 Western Cape Prestige Agri Awards winner. Over to you, Duncan. Why is it so important for the department to celebrate agricultural workers? Well, firstly, we come out of a, and we still are in a global pandemic. So the morale was quite low of many people around the world, but we also know that agriculture was classified during COVID-19 as an essential service, meaning that agriculture workers need to work during the harvest season, production season, but also during the distribution season. And so for us, it is important to recognize the work and the contribution of agri-workers because during COVID-19, people still had to eat and everything that we celebrate, every meal is the product of the work from our agri-workers. So we will continue to support our agri-workers, but more so agri-workers in the Western Cape constitute about 17% of the total labor force and we have about 226,000 agri-workers, very important people, and they need the recognition and they need the acknowledgement for what they have done. And so we are proud as the Western Cape Department of Agriculture to continuously invest and support and we are thankful for the contribution of Soprite, our anchor sponsor of this particular project, but also our producers, also Agri-Western Cape, as well as Agri-Expo and all the 
people involved directly and indirectly in the agricultural sector. We not only celebrate but also salute the agri-workers here in the Western Cape. When you come to these competitions that, you know, the participants that entered the year before, that they are now in a new position, they've grown in their businesses or the establishments that they work in. How would you rate um, the Western Capes in terms of developing farm workers in the Western Cape? Well, we know that the Western Cape is the only department of agriculture in the country that does have an agri-worker competition, an agri-worker sports day, an agri-worker magazine, an agri-worker program, an agri-worker investment, but also an agri-talent competition. So we take agri-workers quite seriously because they are really, as we say in Afrikaans, the South van die Aarde, and their contribution is massive. And so we will continue to invest. We also have through our Department of Cultural Affairs we do have an annual Agri Sports Day. It normally happens here in Robertson, where all the regions come together and play sport. But in addition to that, I'm very thankful for Artscape, as well as the Department of Cultural Affairs and Sport, who are partnering with the Agri workers because there's also an Agri competition where people are taking part in art and sing and dance competition. You're also familiar with the real dance competition of the Arti Cafe. All of this is to acknowledge the work of agri-workers. We had one of the people that provided entertainment, was one of the winners of the agri Talent Faith, and she performed brilliantly. So I think what we're trying to do is to recognize the contribution, and we would also like to encourage other provinces to also recognize agri-workers in their provinces. Because when you invest in agri-workers, there's a greater return on your production and your export. As a result of what we are doing in the Western Cape, we have now seen that we have last year had a 24% increase in our agricultural exports. And agricultural exports last year was 76 billion rand. And we are now responsible for 53% of South Africa's agricultural exports. And the credit must go to our agri-workers our producers and our export agencies and I'm very proud yeah. of the work that we do but we need to roll this program out to the rest of the country because the people here tonight they have families in other provinces and they are asking me how can we bring this program to their provinces mm -hmm. so we call on our MECs for agriculture in the other provinces to also try to implement a similar program because other regions are also strong in agriculture and we want to save agriculture in South Africa. I'm sure you would agree that it's important to get young people interested in the agricultural sector. Yeah, a lot of young people, they look at the sector and they think it's fail work and it's long ear and it's full of sun and light and slap. What is your message to young people that have that perception about agriculture? Agriculture is both primary agriculture and then also secondary agriculture. And there's different fields. We have recently published a booklet called 50 Career Opportunities in Agriculture. So it's not only in the primary agriculture, there's also now in terms of the fourth industrial revolution, opportunities in digital technology, drone technology, and different opportunities in the agricultural sector. And I would encourage the, the youth to also visit www.elsenberg.com and see all the opportunities for the youth. We are now also encouraging more agricultural schools to be established. We are now also introducing more agricultural subjects in schools like agricultural technology, agricultural management and agricultural business. For us it is important that we also encourage the youth. Many of the people that won some prizes are actually quite young here tonight. So there are great opportunities. In the previous Agri Work of the Year, Francois Solier from Willow Creek Olive Farm in the Ney Valley, he went with us two years ago, part of the prize, to visit the Netherlands and the Rotterdam as well as the biggest fruit festival in the world, Fruit Logistica in Berlin. So if you look at the lady that won the prize here tonight, the Agri Worker of the Year, relatively young. So there are great opportunities for the youth in agriculture. In fact, Agriculture is becoming much more sexier. You can actually farm on your phone, you can farm on your laptop, but we would also encourage people to be involved in the secondary agriculture. 
namely the agro-processing. And in that space, there's great opportunities for the youth. Earlier next year, I will roll out an agri-processing on wheels program to show people what you can do with the agricultural products like cheese making, wine making, jam, and any other byproducts that you can develop out of the primary sector. So I think there's great opportunities. I'm excited when I see many of the women involved in uh, the wine industry. Two years ago, we have seen Berlin Souls from the wine industry there in the Overberg region, as well as our colleagues there from uh, Creation Wines, and also our colleagues who were winners in the agricultural uh, FIA called the Female Entrepreneurs in Agriculture. So I think there are great opportunities in this particular space for the youth to be involved through both the agricultural schools, the agricultural college, Alsenberg, but also through people joining our program in winemaking, but also people who are interested in joining other types of programs. So the youth globally are becoming more and more interested in agriculture because agriculture has now moved with the times. Yeah. What is your vision for agri-workers in the Western Cape? One of my visions for agri-workers here in the Western Cape is that they uplift the living conditions, building dignity, three things. One, the vision that I have for agri-workers is that we increase an understanding of the importance of building dignity, a dignified life, dignified living conditions on the farm and a dignified working environment. That's my vision because farm workers demands respect. Farm workers are early up in the morning, they work late and they are producing what we eat in our plate. So my first vision for agri-workers is that we treat them with dignity and respect and secondly that we create further opportunities for them in the value chain of agriculture and for those people that want to migrate to the next level some of them want to become small-scale farmers some of them want to enter another phase not everyone that is good in agriculture can become a farmer but some of them do have the potential to become a farmer and one of the previous winners of the agri-worker competition C is a farmer C is now also a councillor in a municipality. So I think what we see, and one of the previous winners, he has an honours degree in agriculture. So farm workers that win this competition, there's a great path for them for further development. But the biggest dream that I have for them is that we also use them as role models to encourage other people and to further strengthen the agricultural sector. Thanks, Duncan. And great having you, Western Cape Minister of Agriculture, Dr. Ivan Mayer. Don't miss our Farmers Inside Track Weekend Edition when we catch up with this year's winner, Audrey September. I can't wait. Next up, Sibon Kosim Sipa joins our Agripreneur 101 segment. Now her chocolate chip cookies had clients at Amazing Spaces running back for more and now she proudly markets her own cookie range. Sibon Kosi, we know you as the chocolate chip cookie baker of the year. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? My name is Mama Bongi. I am from Zimbabwe and I have been working for Amazing Spaces before. The business started when I was working for Amazing Spaces. I was making lunches for the girls and baking the cookies, the crunches for our clients. So the clients loved the cookies and they were like, how can we get these cookies? So Julia was like, Mama, I think this is a good thing for you. Just go for it. Just start your own business. And then we can call the business Mama Bongi. That's how it started. What are some of the challenges you face in your business? And what are some of the more rewarding aspects? The challenges we faced in the business was during lockdown, when we ran out of packaging. Then fortunately, Julia had a friend who gave us the packaging which she was writing on those packaging. And I was also busy baking there and queues. A lot of people were waiting, wanting the cookies. That was a, a challenge of not having enough packaging. Some of the rewarding aspects, you know, when I go to the shops, like maybe pick and pay, I got people want to take a photo for me and being recognized. And the other thing, my first time going to Zimbabwe on a plane, Oh, that was a rewarding aspect to just to fly from Cape Town to Zimbabwe. What keeps you inspired or motivated? What keeps me motivated is now I can manage to take care of my family. 
and we hired people who are also taking care of their families which also it makes me happy so for them to also improve their lives i'm also happy about that what are your top five tips for aspiring agripreneurs who may want to follow in your footsteps the advice i would give to you guys who want to also do the businesses is you must work hard two you must have a mentor three don't hesitate to ask don't wait for perfection just start also you must associate yourself with positive people you will never go wrong thanks duncan and zibongin gosim sipa who produces her own chocolate chip cookie range called mama bongi now for our book of the week as chosen by farmers the lie of 1652 by patrick tarek mellet in this radical critique of established pre-colonial and colonial history mellet centers land dispossession the destruction of livelihoods and the brutality of slavery in south africa nicole ludolf food from zanzi's journalist reviews this book for us land ownership in south africa has always been a contentious issue With the lie of 1652, Patrick Tariq Mellet maps out the history of the land from prehistoric South Africa to the dawn of democracy. The lie of 1652 is an engrossing read, with Mellet using dozens of academic sources to interrogate common historical myths, including the first people myth and that of empty land. He paints a vivid image of the link between land and culture. and how land expropriation in the past informed cultural extermination and new amalgamated identities based on stereotypes mellet draws links between the dispossession experienced by black south africans and how it informs the shape of our current society his critique starts prior to 1652 and explores themes of loss home and belonging agriculture is not just about farming It's about caring and that's an ideal worth preserving. It's yummy. It's good for you and the whole family loves it. It's grain-filled chickens, proudly South African and mouth-wateringly delicious. Discover a world of tasty goodness and visit Grain-Filled Chickens to see other zeri or like our Facebook page for more. Grain-Filled Chickens, a proud member of VKB. VKB for the love of the land. Definitely have to get my hands on that book. Thanks Nicole. Now remember if you'd like to review a book or perhaps you have a book suggestion of your own, feel free to email us at info@foodfromzanzi.co.za. Now before we let you go, we now share our farmer tip of the week from beekeeper and founder of Eden Roots, Metsana Kojane, on how to get started in the bee farming industry. What one would need other than the beehives and the bees themselves would be a bee suit, a smoker, a smoker, this little pot that we use to generate smoke. I usually use cow dung in my smoker. Smoke comes down the bees when you are working. So beekeepers do use a lot of smoke. Obviously a bee suit because we don't want to be stung. A bee sting can be dangerous, much as it is very beneficial. But the dangers of a bee sting is that you know you get people who are allergic to bee sting. If you are stung and you are allergic to bee venom, then your life might just be in danger. And then you need a a bee brush because when you're getting them off the way, you need something gentle to you know brush them off. A hive tool. this little thing called a hive tool that one needs because sometimes your lid gets glued onto the hive itself so you use that to open it up a hive tool is a multi-purpose thing that you you can use for different purposes still within the hive i think for a start that's basically it those are basic ones and our farmer tip of the week from beekeeper and founder of eden roots metsana kojane brings us to the end of this week's farmers inside track Proudly brought to you by Food Form Zanzi. For daily inspirational stories about the farmers and agriculturalists to go above and beyond to feed South Africa, visit foodformzanzi.co.za or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and don't forget to catch our weekly sessions on Twitter Spaces called Gather to Grow. And then there's Instagram and YouTube. So many options for you to follow 
and review all of our great stories and content. That's right. And remember, if you love this podcast, please rate it and share it with your friends, family members, and of course, your fellow farmers. The Farmer's Inside Track is available for free on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. And of course, not forgetting also on foodformzanzi.co.za. But from me, Duncan Masiwa, Don Numdu, Nicole Ludov, and our producer, Megan van der Fendt, and the rest of Team Food from Zanzi, have a great week. Corteva is in it for farmers, for good. As a company solely focused on agriculture, we understand the impact of climatic and soil diversity, the unique requirements of each region, each farmer, each crop, and the need for sustainability. To this, we apply our global mind. With 5,000 researchers in more than 130 countries, ensuring farmers of advanced seed technology and guarding growing investments through innovative crop protection. Local investment includes research facilities on par with our best in the world and the largest private insectary in Africa. Advanced genetic breeding is combined with intense trials, testing and refinement in different bioclimatic zones to bring forth the best in-class products. Beyond in-seed value, our on-seed applied technology on farm crop protection, digital and agronomic solutions are all designed to optimize farmers' productivity, profitability and sustainability. Because by being wholly devoted to agriculture, we have a deeper understanding of farming, the needs of our farmers, and the country's need for farmers. This is what drives our researchers to find new avenues for sustainable growth. It is the reason for having state-of-the-art seed production technology on home ground. Our motivation for creating effective, locally proven solutions to protect land and crops with care for the future. This is the world of Corteva in South Africa. Growing progress, enriching lives, now and for generations to come. Corteva, keep growing. You've been listening to the Farmers Inside Track podcast, supported by Food Form Zanzi. For more information, find us on www.farmersinsidetrack.co.za.